This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson 13 from the series Rest in Christ is titled The Ultimate Rest. It's ready for teaching on September 25 and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 18. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we know from your word that Jesus came and lived and died, that each of us could have eternal life and that he is coming back again, that there may be eternal rest for each of us and that rest will be with him, with you, with the saints from all eternity. We pray now, Lord, as we open your word, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, memory text this week is 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Let's read that again, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor or have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Have you ever felt that you were in the midst of a great battle, a kind of struggle between good and evil? Many, even secular people, have sensed this reality, and we feel that way because, well, it's true. We are in a great battle between good and evil, between Christ, the good, and Satan, the bad. Life, then, is really being played out on two levels. The great controversy between Christ and Satan is taking place on a global scale. In fact, even a cosmic level, for in heaven is where it first began. Let's read Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Yet, in the confusion of events, we can easily lose the big picture of God's escape plan for this world. Wars, political unrest and natural disasters can hold us in helpless terror. But God's prophetic guidance can help us keep in mind the big picture of where we are going and how we will get there. The great controversy also is being played out on a much more personal level. All of us individually face faith challenges in our everyday life, and if we die before the second coming of Jesus, we will face death too. This week, we look at how we can rest in Jesus in the face of global unrest and our own unknown future, at least in the short term. In the long term, things look very promising indeed. Uh... Sunday, September 19, A Vision of the End The oldest surviving disciple actually to have been with Jesus sat on a rocky prison island far from everything that was near and dear to him. What must have been going on in John's mind as he found himself stranded on this desolate island? How did he wind up there, and like this too? After all, he had seen Jesus leave, and he had seen the two angels standing there, saying, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts 1.11 That, however, had been years and years ago, and Jesus had not yet returned. Meanwhile, the other apostles present on that day already had died. Most of them martyred for their witness about Jesus. The young church had undergone a generational change and was now facing horrible persecution from the outside and strange heretical movements from within. John must have felt alone, tired and restless, and then suddenly he was given a vision. What comfort can you imagine that John got from this vision that we read in Revelation 1, verses 9 to 19? I, John, 
both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and, having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead man. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, for I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Jesus had told his followers, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, in Matthew 28, 20, words that no doubt must have encouraged John as he faced his lonely exile. Surely this vision, this revelation of Jesus, must have been a great comfort to him, knowing that Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, was now manifesting himself in a special way to the exiled apostle. What followed from these verses were visions about the future of this world. An awesome panoramic view of history would be portrayed before him. Basically, what's to us the history of the Christian church, but was to him its future? And yet, amid the trials and tribulations that would come, John was shown how it would all end in Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. The great apocalyptic vision John has recorded in Revelation helped John confidently to rest in God's provisions and promises. And so to finish the day... Life now can be hard, even fearful at times. How, though, does knowing that God knows the future and that the future long term is good give us comfort now? Monday, September 20, The Countdown On the Mount of Olives, Jesus painted history in broad strokes as he responded to the questions of the disciples. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? In Matthew 24, verse 3. Jesus' famous sermon, recorded in Matthew 24, covers the uninterrupted historical timeline from his days until the second coming and beyond. Jesus wanted to give his people throughout the ages a rough sketch of the divine schedule for end-time prophecies, so that those living at the end of time could be prepared for the ultimate event. He wanted us to be able to rest confidently in his love, even when everything around us is falling apart. Adventists know well Daniel's description of a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation in Daniel 12.1. Jesus wants us to be prepared for this event, which precedes his second coming. Question, what will his coming be like? 
How can we avoid being deceived? Matthew 24, verses 4 to 8, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And Matthew 24, verses 23 to 31. Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is Christ, and there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angel with a great shout of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus' coming will be a literal event at the end of time. Considering the space given in prophecy to his return, and even in Jesus' sermons, this is a big deal. The last time there was a worldwide climactic event, only eight people in all the world were ready for it. Jesus compares the unexpectedness of the second coming to that event, the flood, in verses 37 to 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. But although no one knows the day or hour of the coming, as verse 36 uh, tells us, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only, God has given us a prophetic countdown that we can watch happening in the world around us. We have been given a role to fill in this prophetic drama. What is our part? Focus on Matthew 24, 9 to 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. In this cosmic conflict, we are more than just observers. We are to be active participants in spreading the gospel to the ends of the world, which means that we too will face persecution. And so to finish the day, What does it mean to endure to the end? How do we do that? What choices do we need to make every day in order not to fall away, as many have done and many will do? Tuesday, September 21. Marching Orders The prophetic big picture of history doesn't just allow us to sit back and do nothing as events unfold, events that we really can't control. So often the attitude can be, well, final events are going to happen as predicted, 
So what can we do about it other than just simply go along with them? After all, what can I alone do? But that's not how Christians are to relate to the world around them, and especially to final events. Revelation 14 tells us that our purpose at this time in history is to tell others about God's judgment and help them prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Read Revelation 14, 6-12, what is being taught here? And what are we to proclaim to the world? Why is this message of such urgency? Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead, or in his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. As Adventists, we believe that present truth, as expressed in Second Peter 1.12, is found specifically in these verses that we refer to as the three angels' messages. Second Peter 1.12 reads, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Here we find the essence of what our calling is at this time in Earth's history. Notice it starts out with the everlasting gospel, the wonderful news of Christ's death and resurrection, upon which our only hope of salvation rests. There also is the message that the hour of his judgment has come, as you read in verse 7, a powerful waymark that points to the end of time. Then too, there is the call to worship the one who made heaven and earth, in contrast to the fearful warning about those who, staying in Babylon, worship the beast and his image. Finally, here is the depiction of God's end-time people. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Read Revelation 14.11. What does it say about the lack of rest for those who worship the beast and his image? And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. No rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image? Though various ideas exist regarding what this exactly means, all would agree that these people do not experience the kind of rest that God offers those who are faithful to Him. And so to finish today, why do you think the first part of the three angels' messages is the everlasting gospel? Why must we keep this wonderful truth always before us as we proclaim these messages to the world? How is understanding the gospel so central to the concept of rest? Wednesday, September 22. Rest in peace. For long centuries now, Christians have been awaiting Christ's return. It is truly the culmination of all our hopes, and not just ours, but the hopes of all God's faithful throughout all history. 
Read Hebrews 11, 13-16. What great promise is there, not just for the people of old, but for ourselves as well. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they came out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them." In many ways, these verses make no sense if the common and popular version of death were true. What is the passage talking about? These people not having received the promises? They're dead, supposedly now, up in heaven with Jesus enjoying their great reward. When, for example, Billy Graham died again and again, we heard how he was now in heaven with Jesus. There's an irony too in this view, because often when someone dies we hear, may he or she rest in peace. But what is going on here? Are such people resting in peace? Or are they up in heaven doing whatever they are supposed to be doing, such as watching all the fun down here? How does Jesus describe death? Let's look at John 11 and verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. In fact, the idea of their resting in peace is of course the truth about what happens at death, isn't it? The dead truly are at rest, as we read in the Desire of Ages, page 787. To the believer, death is but a small matter. Christ speaks of it as if it were of little moment. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. He shall never taste of death. To the Christian, death is but a sleep, a moment of silence and darkness. The life is hid with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory." quoting John eight fifty one and 52 and Colossians 3, verse 4, end of quote. Jesus compares a person's condition between death and resurrection morning to an unconscious sleep. As we've read in John eleven eleven. let's do that again. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And three verses later in verse 14, Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But he also emphasizes that both the saved and the lost will receive their reward after the resurrection in John 5 verses 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. He highlights the necessity of being prepared for death whenever it comes. And so to finish the day, what comfort do you get from knowing that your deceased loved ones are indeed now at rest? Thursday, September 23. Rejoice in the Lord always. One of the most used apps on our smartphones is Google Maps. Most of us cannot remember what we did before GPS-based maps existed on our phones. We may be nervous heading toward a place that we have never been to before, but with Google Maps on our phones, we can confidently venture out and find our way in any foreign city. Could this confidence be an illustration of the kind of rest God wants to give us with his prophetic timetable? Sometimes, however, we may enter the wrong address into our apps or we may just decide not to follow the directions because we think we know a shortcut. 
In either case, we may end up somewhere we didn't want to be, and most definitely not in a restful frame of mind either. Read Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. What is Paul saying here to us about the way to have true rest, true peace, even amid a harried and painful world? Philippians 4, beginning at verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In this passage, Paul is not saying to rejoice always in all the trials that you are facing. Instead, he is saying rejoice in the Lord always. No matter what our present situation, no matter what trials we are facing, if we dwell on God, on His goodness, His love, and on His sacrifice on the cross for us, we can rejoice in Him and have peace for our weary souls. Just the very tone of the texts implies rest, peace, and a transcendent hope of something beyond this world. Imagine, too, the kind of rest for our souls that we would have if indeed we could be anxious for nothing. This hardly seems realistic for anyone in this world. Even Paul had plenty of worries. But again, knowing that a loving God is ultimately in control and will save us into His kingdom can surely help us put the things that we are anxious about into proper perspective. The Lord is at hand, that is, He is always close to us, and as soon as we close our eyes and rest in the sleep of death, the next thing we know is the return of Christ. No question, life is full of tensions, trials and struggles. None of us escape them. Certainly Apostle Paul didn't either, as we read in Second Corinthians chapter 11. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, for we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted, because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them, to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. I say again, let no one think me a fool, if otherwise at least receive me as a fool, that I may also boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this con confidence of boasting, seeing that many boast according to the flesh, I also will boast. For you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise, for you put up with it. If one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. To our shame I say that we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. 
Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labours more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the thing which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed for ever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guiding the city of the D Damascenes with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Nevertheless, this point is to tell us that even with all that we endure now, we can rejoice in what we have been given in Christ, and indeed we can find rest for souls even now. And so to finish today, read Philippians 4 verses 4 to 6 again. In what ways can you apply these wonderful words to your experience right now in whatever trials and tribulations you are facing? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Friday, September 24. From the book Gospel Workers by Ellen G. White, page 219, we read... We all desire immediate and direct answers to our prayers and are tempted to become discouraged when the answer is delayed or comes in an unlooked-for form. But God is too wise and good to answer our prayers always at just the time and in just the manner we desire. He will do more and better for us than to accomplish all our wishes. And because we can trust his wisdom and love, we should not ask him to concede to our will, but should seek to enter into and accomplish his purpose. Our desires and interests should be lost in his will. End of quote. And from the same author, Councils on Stewardship, page 350. It will only be a little while before Jesus will come to save his children and to give them the finishing touch of immortality. The graves will be opened and the dead will come forth victorious, crying, O death, where is thy string? O grave, where is thy victory? Our loved ones who sleep in Jesus will come forth clothed with immortality. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Think about the reality of the great controversy. How do you see it being played out in the world? How about in your own personal life? It's very real, isn't it? In fact, it's more real than many people think, because many don't believe in a literal devil. Why is understanding the reality of the great controversy so important in helping us to understand the state of our world? Also, why is our understanding of how this great controversy will end so comforting? 2. Prophecy can be a distraction if we try to go beyond what is clearly revealed. How often have church members gotten in trouble making predictions about events that didn't come to pass, or believing in others' predictions that didn't come to pass? 
How can we protect ourselves from falling into that kind of trap? 3. In class, go over Revelation 14, 9 to 11, and the question about those who worship the beast and his image not having rest. What might that mean? Let's just read those texts. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. And four, a controversial topic in the church has to do with what role we do or do not have in the timing of Christ's return. Whatever position one takes on this, why is it still very important that we take an active role in spreading the message of his return to the world? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Tough First Day at School, and it's by Andrew McChesney. The first day of school was hard for Niang Myung. Really, really hard. The nine year old girl had arrived in the United States only a month earlier from Myanmar. Her parents were refugees. She didn't know English, and she didn't have any friends. Hello, what's your name? a girl asked. Niang shook her head. No, she said. Oh, said the girl, confused. Where are you from? Niang shook her head again. No, she said. Niang was not trying to be rude. She just didn't understand. Because she didn't know English, she sat quietly all morning in class. At lunchtime, she followed the other children to the cafeteria and looked at the food being served. Nacho cheese and shredded beef, mini pizzas, chicken nuggets. The food was very strange to her. She was used to eating mustard leaves, potato leaves, watercress, brown beans and red lentils. After tasting the food, she returned to the classroom and sat quietly until school ended for the day. At home, she prayed for help. Dear God, please help me survive another day at school, she said. Fourth grade was tough, but fifth grade was better. She began to speak English and to make friends. What's your name? a girl asked. My name is Niang, she replied with a shy smile. And where are you from? the girl asked. I'm from Burma, which is also called Myanmar, Niang said. The girl nodded her head. She had heard of the country. Several other refugee children from Myanmar also studied at their school. OK, OK, she said. Do you want to play? Niang felt happy. She was beginning to fit in. She felt even happier in seventh grade. She was able to transfer from the public school to a Seventh-day Adventist school thanks to money from a 2011 13 Sabbath offering to help refugees in the North American division. She thanked God in her daily prayers. Dear God, thank you so much for helping me learn this new language and for taking care of me, she prayed. And I know that there are people who are listening to this uh, reading of the Sabbath school lesson who are learning English doing it. And may God bless you and may your English continue to improve. But you don't have to speak it with a Percy Harold accent. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help more child refugees like Niang study at Adventist schools. Niang is now 21 and there's a photograph of her right here and studying to become a mission doctor. I was a mission doctor once in Hong Kong from 1974 to 1978. May God bless each of us as we continue to study his word and look forward to next quarter's lessons. 
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.